give a welcome here to John Hayes, K7 Victor Echo. He was going to give us an update on the Amper Net, the 44 Net. Thank you, John. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. You're going to see a whole bunch of slides go past here really quick. Um, uh, I'm kind of, you know, reuse is a good thing. Um, and uh, so that's what Brian was talking about there for a minute. Okay, so um, how many people here are familiar with Net44 or AmperNet? Okay. Um, so what it is is um, with some foresight, uh, a gentleman in California, when the internet was young, and I guess I was too, uh, got us an allocation specifically for amateur radio. And back then, networks were classified A, B, and C. And an A had 16 million addresses. And so we have 16 million addresses out there um, that are kind of sitting dormant. <laughs> there, there's a little utilization of them, but but it's it's not um, being utilized in a in a um, a wide application. And we've we've had these for Brian. Are you in the room? The other Brian. I think Brian stepped out. Uh, we've had them for 25, 30 years, and. They're kind of cool, um, you know, Bedell and Phil and I, uh, back in the day, uh, when we were younger too, uh, played with a lot of this stuff. Uh, Phil uh, and I met back in Massachusetts when I was in the Air Force, and Bedell was in Colorado part of the time I was in Utah, and, and, and we... Um, we're playing with all this stuff. I was sending TCP IP over 1200 baud packet through seven net ROM nodes to California and getting my 20 bits per minute <laughs> effective data rate. Uh, but it was fun and I learned a lot and, and Bedell and I both worked for HP. I, I went on, he continued a career there. Um, uh, a lot of my career I had a lot more in-depth understanding of network protocols because I watched them go by at 1,200 bits per second. It's kind of hard to watch, you know, a sonnet ring and figure out the protocol. But at 1,200 baud, you can watch it paint on your screen and, and so on. So um, it's it served me well, and we'd like to pass that on to future generations. Um, so uh, basic. Ground rules, as I said, uh, is uh, uh, it must be used for ham radio. Uh, otherwise, they'll want it back because it's valuable. Um, so the network kind of started with IP over AX25 at 1,200 bits per second with collisions and all kinds of things, which took it down. Um, a lot of manual processes were developed. Um, I am the address coordinator for Western Washington. At various times, I've been the address coordinator in other areas as I've moved around a bit. Uh, you want an IP address, you send me an email, I talk to a robot, the robot adds it to a list, it comes out probably within the next day. If you're talking to other stations, you know, it's, it's fun to talk to yourself, but it, it's, it's more fun if you're talking to other stations. Uh, you need to have routing tables to tell you how to get mm, your bits to someone else's place. Uh, that's all kind of manually maintained right now. There, there are uh, files that get copied around between different gateways on the network. Um, it's fairly limited. Uh, we've got little pockets of semi-activity here and there. Uh, and the way they talk to each other is they take the IP packets for Net44 and they wrap them in the IP packets from their service provider and ship it based on these manually maintained routing tables to similar gateways around the world. And if you want to talk 
to the internet, then it has to go to the University of California, San Diego through a throttled pipe to get out to the internet. And so in today's world, that seems just slightly limiting. Um, and, and it looks something like this. So uh, here we have uh, three different lands that could be anywhere in the world. And they, because of these tables, <coughs> can talk with each other if they're up to date and maintained. And they can each independently talk to uh, the main gateway to get to and from the internet. And um, that's exciting. Uh, I'm kind of like Brian. Sometimes I, I get, you know, I have this real question. You know, we, we come up with these great ideas in ham radio, and then we figure out the hardest way to do it. Um, so back then, you know, you, you took the retired 286 that had the noisy disk drive in it, and, and some good programs were written, NOS by Phil, and later JNOS and some others, and you put that on them and that hooked up to your TNC and your old gauntlet set, and you kind of sort of made it work. Um, and, and then you had this kind of obtuse way of declaring routing tables and so on that get manually copied over, and Today, I was going to bring a visual aid, but I forgot to grab it. Um, you can buy a very capable router that can do everything that that several hundred watt creaky old 486 that you upgraded to 15 years ago uh, in a little tiny package like that and draws like one watt, you know, kind of thing. Um, so why don't we use some of the advancement of the last 30 years to build a real network? So there's this vision out there, and it's been coming from a, a few different places. Um, we've got this address space. We may as well connect it all together <laughs> and be able to talk to each other. And there's actually quite a number of applications out on the internet that are ham radio specific, that use IP as their transport. And the flex radio, the UDR, are other examples of that where you might want to talk to them over the internet. Um, one of the nice things is, if we're using this 44 net address space, you can tell your flex radio if there are commands coming in and it's not from network 44, ignore them. There are um, uh, several applications like that. Um, and we, might could, we want to make it really easy to set up a new gateway. So using some of this off-the-shelf technology, we can have basically pre-configured routers that you can buy for under $100 with everything with it and drop it in and have a gateway. Now when you want to jump off to RF, you're going to need something like your TNC and old FM radio or something like the UDR or some other uh, more uh, modern uh, type of equipment that you'll hook onto that with Ethernet. So <clears throat> Brian Cantor, who is the custodian of that address space and is here at the conference, um, pulled together a small uh, committee uh, a few months ago. Um, we kept it small because we wanted to get something done. Um, and what will be published shortly uh, on the amper.org website is the new acceptable use policy for AmperNet. And what comes out of it is that um, we're going to be able to delegate that address space to more places so it doesn't all have to go through 
Southern California anymore. And a lot of automatic processes are either built or in the process of being built to get rid of these manual processes of sending things around. Um, so, <clears throat> how many people here are network engineers? Most of you know what BGP is. So, what you'll be able to do is if you have the experience and the ability and the access to some point of presence on the internet where you could offer up a BGP, <clears throat> you'll actually be able to get an agreement with the Amateur Radio Digital Communications Corporation to get your own uh, segment of the network and advertise it to the broader in internet. So what this means now is instead of having a tiny straw to get data back and forth to the internet, we've got this giant sieve. And it'll be a, you know, a thousand points of light if we want to go back a couple of decades uh, <laughs> that can now talk to the larger internet. But as far as address space is concerned, if it's from net 44 or going to net 44, you know you're going in and out of the uh, amateur radio domain. Whoops. So, um, so there are applications that make sense to use this. You know, some of it's just traditional, you know, regional use of IP address space. So, someone that is a second tier ISP uh, who can put things into BGP tables and just offer the service to hams internally uh, might get a what we call a sitter 16 um, allocation and we won't do anything less than 24 uh, because then the internet police will come beat up on us uh, but it will allow us to start segmenting this address space out and you can have the regional ones. You can also have application specific. So let's say you've got IRLP nodes, or you've got D-Star gateways, or you've got Winlink RMS gateways, or a high-speed multimedia network for your ARIES group. What uh, you might want to do is get an allocation for that service and you can VPN in the individual units. One of the problems we had in DSTAR for a long time and still do to some extent is a lot of them are on consumer grade broadband and you end up with, um, they'll only give you one IP address and it's dynamic and if they're a bad ISP they change it every 30 seconds and it's hard to keep things routed when you're in that situation. However, if you're on a VPN, the modern VPN protocols can handle the public IP address changing pretty rapidly as long as it knows the other end and it can keep the sessions going to now what are public IP addresses on net 44. So if you run an RMS gateway and you say that it is at this domain address, which maps to this IP address, it doesn't matter what the public inter IP address you got for your, um, your ISP is, you can always address it at this Net44 address. So it gives you a lot of capability there. And again, it's not real security, but at least you have an idea it's coming from or going to a ham radio resource if it's not on net 44. So uh, capable hams can apply for a revocable subnet delegation. What that means, what that means is if you play by the rules and you don't sell it off to your employer or something like that, uh, you'll be uh, authorized to have this, this subnet and if you break the rules, the agreement is that it gets pulled. So as long as you're playing by the rules, you can get the address space up to 
Uh, the smallest block that will come out of those 16 million is 256, which is a sitter of 24. Um, you must have a non-political willingness to tunnel to smaller subnets at no cost. So let's say you're in Atlanta and you know this is a population center so you might request a a full um, uh, slash 16 and then you've got some outlying areas that need some addresses and you're going to VPN those in to your router well you can't charge for it and you can't be political about it okay we, do, we don't need those kinds of wars um, and you have to be able to demonstrate that you can set up and maintain it so with subdelegation, then you've got a situation where you're the BGP going to the internet, and then you've got these smaller networks that are coming through you to go out, and of course they can talk to each other just using the, the 44 IP address, because if it's local, it'll go through your router and back if it's another 44 that's out over the internet. And we will allow dual homing, so in, in certain situations it may make sense for one to be um, in more than one location. Uh, this is an interesting project, a guy's working up in, in our neighborhood where he wants to do a 150 megabit per second loop of microwave stations covering the whole Puget Sound basis. We don't know if that's going to happen, but it might make sense in that case for him to have a relatively large allocation of addresses here. I, I'm, I'm indicating maybe 32,000 uh, for individual uh, home units to be able to get into it. It's all on microwave, so mobile's not going to be real popular there. Uh, you need to be able to support a choice of VPN tunnels, not necessarily everyone that's out there. But again, going back to my earlier bu bullet point about easy to deploy, there are certain VPNs that it's real trivial to put them into a little router that costs $39 and have them be part of this network. Um, and so basically, um, we also would probably uh, go with a situation where you have uh, more use of DHCP and other dynamic uh, allocations to get the IP addresses and domain names out to uh, where it made sense, um, especially for mobile use. I know in my address space that I uh, the, am the coordinator for, we've got stations that have got IP addresses on five different lands because they might pass through them or they might see them. And, and there's no, really no sense to do that. They should get the their IP address from the land they're on and the routing works and it's all cool and stuff like that. And of course with uh, radios like the UDR then 56k mobile mm, is probably more reasonable. Uh, so you might have a situation where you're driving through a metropolitan area and you're switching from land to land and node to node and if you have frequency agility and a GPS so you know where you are and a few other things it becomes more like a cell system where you're moving in and out of different lands and your IP address may change, but your domain name will stay the same. And, and, and if people need to call you, they can do it. Of course, going out, it's not a big deal. Uh, the, you know, the DNS name can travel with you. Talked about the virtual networks. And so any questions you might have on that? Yeah, since, um since you're going to be sending BGP advertisements to the network, do you have an autonomous system number? Or are you going to require each group to get their own ASNs? I will leave that to people that are more expert in that to answer that question. But um, it might be through the ASN of the ISP that's advertising your BGP. OK, normally you need an AS right. in order to advertise routes. Have you talked with any carriers about being able to accept a, um, advertisements, a lot of carriers won't accept BGP ads. Right, right, right. Understand. Jeremy can probably answer those questions if people have more specifics. V6, where is that going to come in? Well, uh, one of the great things about V6 is V4 maps inside of it. True. We own 16 million V4 addresses. We probably aren't going to use them up real quick. Uh, 
but there's no reason you couldn't have as part of a larger network, you know, some V6 space as well. Well, since V6, everybody in the room would probably have 500 of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's another thing that, that comes out of this, though, is so let's say that in your ham shack at home, you put in um, three UDR 56Ks and a flex radio and some of the applications running on them, and you got a bunch of other things, want to use the same uh, well-known ports to talk to them, like a web port or something like that. Well, if you go to your ISP, he's going to give you one IP address. He might block port 80 for you to run a website on it. But if we VPN, say, eight addresses to your house that are publicly routable, now you've got a situation where you have static routable IP addresses available to you for multiple applications inside of your shack. I personally have a Class C network because I was around when you could still get them. Um, and, and I have those uh, tunneled into my house and I have several applications and servers and stuff like that. So uh, there's a lot of utility that can come out of that. Yeah, I can probably answer to the technical question of BGP. There is no technical reason why we couldn't do both allowing people to use their own AS or using a central AS that the corporation acquire, would acquire. It, it might cost some money, of course, to do that too. Um, but there are plenty of people like myself and some I, that I know who are network engineers who have access to their own AS. So we can do both. Yep. And VPNs and whatever, if we like. Yeah. I used to be a little knowledge, more knowledgeable about that, but I got the lumbotomy and I work in management now. Well, at least you're not a marketer. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is about if we've got these, these tunnelable and routable ampernet that may be going over a gateway through to HSMM or to something that's actually using uh, amateur frequencies, how do we deal with the issues of, of content filtering? Mm -hmm. And how do we deal with the issues of uh, third-party traffic? Uh, my, my big problem is somebody sits down at their computer or somebody's wife grabs their laptop and they're on the HSMM net and instead of on their local internet connection and orders a pizza from Papa John's. Mm -hmm. Now, am I as the control op of the gateway responsible? How, how do you solve those problems? Well, I, I mean, it's the same issue that we had. In, and, of course, the FCC told us 20 years ago that you can order a pizza over amateur radio. So that particular case is okay. Um, so here's the, here, here's the way I kind of vision it. So at your house, you're probably natted out for your LAN in your house out to the internet and the computers there can get to anything. And I'm aware of the time and we'll wrap this up. Uh, but the routers, could say only accept inbound connections from other 44.net addresses. And there's a reasonable argument to be made at that point that you're trying to limit the traffic to amateurs only. Outbound connect to anything, right? Um, the, the content is really the responsibility of the person uh, who puts it on RF. So the endpoints have to kind of make that decision. We're out of time. I'll be around. I'll be kind of, you know, the two red shirts you heard from Twiddly D and now you've heard from Twiddly Dumb. Um, and uh, we'll be glad to answer some more questions offline. Thank and you. And that's, that's all the time we have. Thank you very much, John.